Hello, everyone. everyone. Welcome to episode number one of Chilled and Killed, a true crime podcast where we discuss a crime over a glass of wine. We are your hosts, Sam and Amanda, and this week we are discussing a man known for his weird interests in partying with mannequins by his pool. For this week's wine, we chose Melodramatic Red Blend, a California red blend of 50% damsel and 50% villain. A glug, glug, glug. Two yeah. shots of vodka. Two, Two shots, shots of melodramatic. Shots. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we just poured our glasses of wine. Panda actually poured it. Yes. Um, and did you take your first sip? I did not. All right, let's do this. I like it. Oh, okay. For for somebody who doesn't drink red, it's drinkable. <laughs> <laughs> That's an A plus in our books. Then. No, yeah. it's good. It's kind of yeah. like. It's not too dry. No, it's not really that dry at all. I'd say didn't suck the life right out. Mm. Because reds can do that. They're more like vampire wine than they are like anything else. Yeah. Um, but we were kind of totally drawn to... Actually, side mm-hmm. note, she just gave this to me as a Christmas present about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and she, Pam, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so um, I don't know. I saw it at the package store and the label drew me in. It's, it's hard to describe. It kind of reminds me of a circus, almost. Yes, like circus stripes, but right. within them there's a male and female. Yeah. But. And then on the back it says 50% damsel and 50% villain, which we thought was pretty fitting for our first ever episode of True Crime. Yes. Not bad. It's good so far. Mm-hmm. I like. I'll drink it. You yeah. think you'll have the whole bottle, or we'll see where it goes? We'll see where it goes. Okay. It's not bad, actually. I really kind of like it. Yeah. All right, so I'm really excited about this story. So, Panda. Um, for those that don't know, Panda is nicknamed Panda, but she is still Amanda. Amanda Panda, same thing, same person. That's just what we call her. Yep. So, you'll hear me calling her Panda just because that's what I know her as. Yep. If she calls me Amanda, I'm probably not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, Panda, do you yep. want to get us started on the story of the man that we are about to talk about? Yes, uh, Mr. Herbert Baumeister. So, Herb was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1947, and he was the oldest of four children in his family. From what we could find, he had a normal upbringing. He was raised in a very loving family, uh, but by his teenage years, however, things had started to get a little rocky with him and his family. His family and friends reported that he had odd antisocial-like behavior and identified that his interest focused around dead animals and human urine, which sounds pretty weird, I know. His friends report that Herb constantly pondered what it would be like to taste human urine, and then even remember one instance where he decided to urinate on his teacher's desk. Ew. Yeah. In another instance, his friends reported Herb discovering a dead crow, and then taking that crow and bringing it into the classroom and placing it on his teacher's desk when she wasn't looking. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're off to a bad start, right? Like, right. what? <laughs> First you pee on her desk, now you're bringing her a crow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How nice of you. <laughs> During this time in Herb's life, his father started to get a little weary of his behavior, as he should. Right. Rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he secretly had him tested uh, for some psychological screening, and his records actually show that he had been given a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and possibly multiple personality disorder, but there was no record of any treatment, which is kind of weird to me. Yeah, me too. So, okay, fast forward a few years to 1956. Um, Herb was attending Indiana University, where he met his future wife, Juliana. We now know her as Julie, and we'll refer to her as that for the rest of our podcast. So, they were first drawn to each other due to their interest in cars and strong conservative views. And after attending only one semester, Herb dropped out of college and picked up an odd job working as a copy boy at Indianapolis Star. Yeah, that I, is odd. I believe a copy boy is just, like, somebody who copies papers for, like, the newspaper. That's kind of what we... That's that's what we've come up with. Yeah. We're not entirely sure, but... 
There's really no more info on that. That's just his title. Copy yeah, Boy. Yeah, Copy Boy. Never heard of it, but okay. <laughs> So in 1971, Julie and Herb got married, bought a house, and started their life together raising three children. So about six months after their marriage, Herb was actually committed to a psychiatric hospital due to a depressive episode that he was having, and he stayed there for about a little over a month. And some reports that we found said that his father was actually the one that committed him, but Julie agreed with his father in saying that it would probably be best for him. Whatever that means. I don't know, but... Don't you think that, like, you know, it's about time? <laughs> <laughs> from what we know now, absolutely. Yeah. Keep him in the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> so after release from the hospital, Herb got a job at the State Bureau of Motor Vehicles, where he later got fired for, hmm, what would you find? Further odd behavior. He was actually again found urinating on a letter addressed to the governor, and then another incident was he sent out a Christmas card where him and another man were dressed in drag. This was all during the time that he was married to. Seeing that Herb was now unemployed, he needed to figure out a way to make a living, and he and Julie decided to open their own thrift store, and they named it Save-A-Lot. In the first year, the store was really successful. They decided that it was so successful they would open up a second location, and around this time, Herb and his wife moved their family to a new home in Westfield, Indiana, and it was called the Fox Hollow Farm Estate. It was a huge home. It was on 18 acres of land, and there was even an indoor swimming pool. Hmm. The pool was Herb's pride and joy. He would keep it clean, keep it tidy. He fully stocked the bar with alcohol, and he even had nicely dressed mannequins placed around the pool, almost as if to have a constant party going on. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I... It, we'll, we'll touch on that again later. <laughs> Nicely dressed mannequins, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about Julie. Uh, the Save-A-Lot business started tanking, and it put a strain on Herb and Julie's relationship. And Julie even stated that their marriage really wasn't that intimate, and during their 25 years married, the two of them were only sexually intimate six times. <laughs> what? What even? Six times. Now, mind you, six times, they have three kids. So they had sex three times to conceive children, and then the other three... Who knows? Were just... <laughs> that. Okay, you have three times in your 25 years to have fun. Pick which times in your marriage it's going to be. Yep. That is just... Mm. We'll, we'll talk about that later, too. Yep, we'll, we'll come back to that, too. Yep. During these stressful times, Julie would actually often take the children on weekend-long vacations, and they would go to their family condo that was like 200 or so miles away, um, north of their home at Fox Hollow. And her would stay home to take care of the business, which, you know, at least what was left of it. And that might not be true. That's just what we thought. While Herb was staying home taking care of this business, his employees would report him leaving the store for hours on end and then coming back smelling of alcohol. And at this time, people were unaware of what Herb was up to, but later we found out the real truth. So in early 1993, just two years after Herb moved to the Westfield area, gay men in Indianapolis actually started to disappear and bodies were starting to be found along I-70. So there was one reported missing victim um, that was seen leaving a gay bar in the nearby area. So that's kind of where police started. They wanted to search the nightlife to see um, what was going on, but they found little to no leads popping up. So it wasn't until 1994 that we get a little bit more insight into what may be going on. Um, we met a man, we'll call him Tony Harris, and he came into the picture and helped provide a lead to the police. One night while Tony was at a club, he noticed a man who was also there looking at missing people posters located on the bar walls, and the poster contained a picture of Tony's missing friend. So after talking with this man for a little bit, he introduced himself as Brian Smart, a landscaper from the Ohio area. So Tony and Brian began talking, and then Brian actually invited Tony to go to um, his house for a swim. Well, not his house, but the house that he was staying at while he was landscaping. Again, or so we thought. Tony agreed, and as they drove up to the home, he remembered seeing a sign that read the word farm. And then he also noticed that the home was located on a large amount of land. So they both entered into this home from a side door, walked downstairs into an indoor pool. Oddly enough, the pool had nicely dressed mannequins scattered all around. You're oh. telling me that there's more than one house 
in the <laughs> Indianapolis area that has an indoor pool and a party of mannequins seems fishy. Seems really fishy. Like, I've never heard about mannequins around a pool, let alone nicely dressed mannequins. Honestly, where do you get a bunch of mannequins from? Oh, you know well, what? He yeah, had yeah. the store. Mm-hmm. Oh, he had the store. He had them from his store. And that's probably where he got the nicely dressed. Like, why is that yeah. such an emphasis? I don't know. But lavish, he... lavishly dressed mannequins. It's a thing. Huh. I don't know. For him, apparently. So Brian, actually, when he got there, he, he offered a drink to Tony, but Tony declined. But Brian did not. He wanted, he wanted to get drink. And so he made himself a drink, and then he suggested that they play a little game which involved autoerotic asphyxia, which is suffocation used to elicit arousal. I have never heard of that before. Yeah, I had not until I started researching for this. So, but Brian, Brian asked Tony if he would do that to him, and he obliged, so Tony began choking Brian with a hose hmm. while Brian masturbated. Oh my god. Stop it. Yeah. And then it was Tony's turn. Oh no, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian started using a hose to choke Tony, but Tony really quickly realized that he, he was not going to get out of this alive, so he pretended to pass out, which pretty much saved his life and scared Brian because Tony popped his eyes open and whew, he was alive. <laughs> huh. Uh, so it, the night did not go as Brian planned, but that's okay because Tony's alive. Oddly. And so before long, Brian ended up driving Tony back to Indianapolis, and they agreed that they would meet again, although Tony really never intended to meet him again, and for obvious reasons. So about a year after that incident, Tony did end up seeing Brian out at one of the bars, but he steered clear of him due to all the disappearances going on and their weird encounter that time. Um, But he did, actually take down his license plate, and he gave it to the police. He just, something occurred to him that something wasn't right, so he went to the police. And from there, the police were actually able to determine that this car did not belong to a Brian Smart, but to a Herb Baumeister. Mm, dun, dun, dun. This is where it gets fishy. Mm-hmm. So, now that kind of raises some questions. Why would this man need to lie and create an alias? What was he hiding? So police became very suspicious of Herb and attempted to search his estate, but without a search warrant, of course, it was difficult to do so. So the police decided to try Julian, see if they could get into the home through her um, acceptance, but she declined. So over the next five months, the police still made no progress in breaking this case, and no new leads were popping up. That was until Julie started to become a little bit more doubtful of her husband, And she started to remember a few different experiences that she had um, with her and her son. So in the year of 1994, around the time of those murders, Julie remembered an instance where their son Eric actually found a human skull and some bones on their property. And Herb's reply to that was that, oh, it must be from my dad's cadaver bodies. Okay, now wait, what did his dad do? So his dad was an anesthesiologist. So, hmm. so tell me how you need cadavers for that? Yeah, and tell me how you need to bring your cadavers home I don't from... think you can do that. No, you definitely cannot do that. So that doesn't even make any sense. I don't know why she believed him in the first place. Back to that, she's very faithful to her husband. <laughs> True. Okay, but nevertheless, that wasn't the only odd occurrence that Julie started to pick up on. So... Julie, like we stated before, she would go away, and during her trips, she kept meticulous diary of what was occurring in her life, and that's where she started to become a little suspicious. Um, She was looking through her diary and started to realize that the dates that she was gone on vacation, where Herb said that he stayed behind to, quote-unquote, take care of business, those dates directly matched the dates that those men went missing. Crazy. Crazy. All right, so Julie and Herb's married and business life at this point was spiraling out of control. Julie filed for divorce in January of 1996, and a few months later, their business doors had closed. Julie had had enough, and her suspicions grew larger, driving her to contact the police and allow them to search her property while Herb was away on vacation. Which was actually kind of crazy, because really, 
Herb never really left home, so this was her really, like, yeah. one and only opportunity to... This was... It was now or never. Yeah, so. honestly. I wonder what made him want to go on vacation in the first place. Like, out of all the times that you've never left home... Yeah, this wasn't the time. Yeah. I don't know. But Did thank he, I thank wonder goodness. if he knew, like, before... Anyway. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. We'll talk discuss yeah <laughs> um but so when herb was away he actually did become aware that the police were getting involved and so he fled to canada away from his family away from the crimes he was out and as the police started excavating they were shocked by what they found and i would be too over the next four days of searching they found more than six thousand pieces of human bone fragments and teeth scattered across all of the home's property and kind of as though it was like decorative pebbles Ugh. Yeah, and, and even they were in the dry creek bed located on the property, which also a weird spot because I don't I don't know just all of it's weird. Yeah, <laughs> decorative pebbles and in the creek set. Yeah, uh, but the so the Indianapolis police report confirms that the remains of at least seven men were found, and that they identified at least four. Um, and a direct quote from the police report states that we agree on seven bodies and four identifications. The seven is an absolute minimum we can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. But my gut feeling is that there are more bodies than those. End quote. I think that we can all agree that that's definitely the minimum. Mm. Um, some other websites that you go to, they report that even up to 11 bodies were found with eight men being identified. So take that as you will. So just nine days after a search on the property began, it was found that Herb Baumeister fatally shot himself in the head with a 357 Magnum in a park in Ontario, Canada. He was 49 at the time of death. Left behind was a simple three-page note providing reasoning for his death. What was that reasoning? It was saying that he decided to end his life due to his failing marriage and business, not because police were getting on to him about all the crimes and murders, and to this day he never admitted to any of the killings, and due to his death, a chance for trial was never granted. So Herb, he still remains as the prime suspect for all these cases, and is known as Indiana's most prolific serial killer. And that's where the case lays today. In addition to those crimes, he was suspected of killing nine other men along I-70 in the mid-80s. Julie stated to police that he traveled I-70 quite a lot. And interestingly enough, those bodies stopped appearing along the interstate once they purchased their 18-acre home. That was not because he stopped killing, but because he had ample land for burial. Yeah, he made all those decorative pebbles. Oh my god. His total body count, including the men on I-70, brings him up to about 20 people so far. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. That's really, that's really a lot of people. And not over really, it really wasn't that long of a span because it was, what, mid-80s and then he killed himself in 94? Yeah. So. 14 years. <laughs> like, that's, that's not. That's, that's a, more than one person every year. That's all we know right now, too. Like, it could be, like, even before that, there could be even more bodies, like, in between that. So, like, we just think it's at least over a body a year, but it could be, like, two two bodies a year, like, depending on however many people. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, we don't really know. These are what we assume of him based on the fact that, I mean, he never left, he, he didn't admit to them, so we think these were him based on the, the way the bodies were found on I-70, but... We can't, we can't say that it's him. We're just, yeah. by police reports and news at the time, like... They've connected them yeah. to him. Yeah. His, yes, his MO. His MO is the same. Okay, yeah. His way of operating. He would, well, I mean, bodies on I-70 were known to have been strangled and left m- mostly naked. Were they males? Like, gay men? Yeah, they were all the gay men that were missing in the early 80s those were the men being found on i-70 but they were just left naked but he didn't have the land at that point to be Mm. bringing them back home to and then disposing of the bodies so his mo might have shifted a little bit but not enough to say that it wasn't him i also feel like i remember reading that didn't he like burn the bodies too yes i also i read that too that a lot of the bone fragments were burnt bone fragments so, like, realistically, like, they can't piece all those bone fragments together. So, like, that, that I know they said that, like, what was it, um, seven? It's seven, well, the police report states seven and four identified. Hmm. But that's what they agree on. 
And yeah. They, but they know, also they, said they that that was an absolute minimum. Right. But even, you know, the police report says that my gut feeling is that there are more bodies. That's wild. Okay, but so what about these mannequins? What are your thoughts on... That's just... that. Well, to me, that's an interesting thing that kind of just, like, goes... Like, we took just a right turn, and mm. I, don't, I don't know how they're connected. It doesn't really make sense to me that he's having a party in his pool room. Because yeah, if anything, like, wouldn't that turn people away? Like, all these men that you're trying to sneak over and, like, party with. Like, if I walked into somebody's house, and they had mannequins thrown in their pool, you bet your ass I'm out of there. Yeah. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, but they also died. Well, yeah, but they had to have stayed, no? Like, I mean, to- here's Tony going along with the plan. Tony got lucky. Yeah, like, why was Tony let go out of all of them? Like, for all we know, yeah, they, the guys could have been like, wow, this is creepy. Why are you have mannequins? I'm going to ditch out. And then Herb was like, hey, actually, no, you're not. But then Tony was able to ditch out. Right. It, Herb drove Tony back. It wasn't even like, yeah, like Tony he had time. ran out. Like, Herb was like, hey, man, I'll bring you back to the bar. Let's meet up again. Sorry, I actually thought you died on my property, but <laughs> yeah. now that you didn't die, let me bring you back and we can meet up. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can't actually only no, no. imagine what was going on in Tony's head, like, driving back, like... Or seeing him again? Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine, like, how fast your heart must be beating when you when you finally see this person again out and you're like... No, 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 no. Can't be. No. <laughs> I mean, good for him, though, because if it weren't for him, like, he probably would not have been caught. I don't want to say quickly because 14 years is still, like, a long time, but relatively, that is pretty quickly. Had it not been for Tony, I feel like it would have been a lot longer because really the only thing that put the police onto Herb was Tony. Yeah. So without Tony, who yeah, knows how long Herb would have been going. Yeah, because Julie wasn't on to him. Like, the only reason no. she was on to him is because then, like, things were, like, coming up. And... Like, the police were planting seeds. Yeah. Without that, she was never going to come to that conclusion. I mean, she should have known if you've only had sex with him for six times. In like 25 years. Like, uh, I think that's healthy. a red flag. <laughs> yeah, that's not... <laughs> I don't know, man. You do you, but that's not how I do me. <laughs> I would say let's find a different marriage. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's so. weird. Yeah, so I don't know. Do you have anything else to say about uh, Herbert Baumeister? Yeah, because I, I, I don't think I do. I don't. I Honestly, when I first heard about him and the mannequins, I was just completely... I don't, I don't even know. Like, I was just, like, weirded out. Like, not even, like, shocked. Not, like, terrified. Just, like... Wow, this man is weird. Bad vibes. Bad vibes. Like, yep. Ugh. Yeah. Well, if you guys are looking for more information on Herb, you can look him up. Um, obviously, is Herb Baumeister, but he's also known as the I-70 Strangler and the Gay Murderer. And how, how's your wine? Because now that we're at the end here. I like it. I yeah. still really do like it. It's very... I don't know. I like it. Yeah, me too. I'm drinking it, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you that I can second that because I'm also drinking it. And it is it's good. Also good. It's good. <laughs> it's kind of, it's great. Oh, beer. also, I should point out that the price range of this one is pretty, oh. it's pretty good. This was um, $12.98, so basically $13. This, was, this is coming from somebody. Panda is notorious for not buying a bottle of wine over $20. Oh, yeah. So if you're looking for something cheap, I got you the description of this and it says a luxurious dark red blend showcases opulent black cherry and blackberry with hints of spicy mocha sips are bold yet silky smooth with a long finish mm. i actually do taste the berryness yeah i don't taste the mocha at no, all no there's no mocha but there's a good <laughs> amount of berry it does say hints but i think they're hidden still <laughs> mm. Mm. no mocha just berry still very good berry i actually almost get the black cherry and the blackberry which is funny because usually I just don't taste any of the things they call out, so. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very good bottle of wine. Yeah. And it was very fitting for our first one. Well, we just want to say thank you for listening to our first ever episode on Chilled and Killed. Uh, we hope you join next week for another discussion about Bracelet's Pizza. He's uh, not 
a murder victim per se, but he's a really interesting case and I think you guys will really enjoy it. Um, I'm very excited for that one. So, so we'll see you again next week. Yeah. Stay tuned. Bye. Bye.